All right. Good morning. God bless you all. We're going to start today, as always, by lifting our voices up to praise him. Will you join us? Yes. All right. Stand with us, please. We serve an awesome God.
exactly how I feel I can't begin To tell you what my love has meant I'm lost for work Is there a way To show the passion in my heart Can I express How truly great I think you are My dearest friend Lord, this is my desire To pour my love on you My coil upon your feet My quiet for you to drink My quarter from my heart I pour my love on you If praises are like perfume I lavish mine on you Till every drop is gone Is there a way to show the passion in my heart? Can I express truly great I think you are, my dearest friend? Lord, this is my desire to pour my love on you, my coil upon your feet. For you to drink like water from my heart, I pour my love on you. It praises like perfume, I lavish mine on you till every drop is gone. I pour my love on you like coil upon your feet, like wine for you to drink, like water from my heart. Like coil upon your feet, like wine for you to drink, like water from my heart, pour my love on you. It praises like perfume, I lavish mine on you, till every drop is gone.
Thank you, Jesus. your unfailing love and grace that brings us here today, Lord. Only you are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. And Lord, we lift up the name of Jesus today, because only he is worthy of our praise and worship. And Lord, we would just pray that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit and touch each heart here today, Lord. We give you thanks. We give you glory. And we give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Woo. All right. Well, hello, New Hope. I want to welcome everyone, and uh, especially our first-time guests and our returning guests. And I want our first-time guests to know how New Hope is a place for imperfect people to belong, to grow, to serve, and to find healing and hope. And we endeavor to do that by loving Jesus, loving people, and serving our city and the world. 
So if you wouldn't mind, turn around and just greet someone and, and just pour out some love on them. Invite them out to lunch. Make a friend. Woohoo! All right. God loves you forever and ever and ever. Isn't that awesome? You know, as, uh, as Americans, we idolize independence. We even have a declaration of independence. We like movies and uh, songs. We love songs called, I'll do it my way. I mean, even... So our, what's happened is that our generation has bought into a myth that if... We have financial independence, relational independence, or if I do not let anyone come close to me because I am totally self-sufficient, then somehow I'm going to be happy. But the problem with that is that the suicide rate has increased almost every year in our generation. Life was never meant to be traveled alone. I mean, consider the fact that the worst punishment in our world is solitary confinement. You and I and everybody else on the planet are finding ourselves unable to love well, to receive love well, to give love well, as we are becoming more and more self-absorbed. And so we're not loving our spouses well. We're not loving our children well. We're not loving our parents well. We're not loving our neighbors and coworkers well, which is really impacting how we're able to receive God's love well and be able to offer God our love well. This if you read through the scriptures, one of the big reasons why the great commandment is to love God and love our neighbor. And we're struggling in a huge way. Now before we go any further and address that with the truth of the scriptures, let's just pause and pray and uh, let's bow our heads. Father God, you are a great God. We, we're just scratching the surface of how deep and long and wide and and high is the love of God. But Father, many of us are consumed, wasting our time to be in the in crowd so that maybe we will feel or experience love and acceptance. And Father, I ask, Lord, that you would give us the power today to be confident that by your grace, we, are, we cannot be more loved than we already are in Christ Jesus. And so we gather here together, and I ask, Lord, help us to do it your way and not to do it our way that leads to sickness and death. And we ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, um, please uh, turn with me to uh, the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. The verses as well will be on the screen. Now, Ecclesiastes was written by uh, a man named Solomon and the uh, son of David. Uh, the Bible describes Solomon as the wisest man in human history. Matter of fact, that there is no one who is ever going to be as wise as Solomon. And now, this is important because when a guy like Solomon says something, it's kind of like the old commercial. If anybody, anybody remember the old commercial when E.F. Hutton speaks? Everybody listen. All right, so this is important right now, right here. So we're going to listen to what, uh, to what uh, Solomon has to say to us in uh, chapter 4, verse 9. It says, For two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him. You know, it's been my experience in almost 25 years that uh, too often people see the, the church as more of a hindrance to their spirituality than actually the fuel in which 
it would grow. And I think about my dad. My dad, who at this point has nothing but disdain for the church and thinks, you know, uh, only fools go there. He fits right into that category. And he has seen so many negative things that he can't even think that there would be anything positive in the church for him. You see, when it, what he can't see is because I think he has blinders on, and this is what I know about human beings. If you're always looking for the negative, what are you going to find? The negative. It's amazing that when you turn your perspective around, you say, okay, I'm going to look for the good, and all of a sudden the good just explodes all over you. It's kind of like watching the news. Always looking at the negative. I mean, you get depressed. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know who would not be on Prozac, not looking at the news every week. Because <laughs> all they're looking at is the negative. And that's all you're going to see. And every once in a while, they'll pepper in a nice, you know, good story. Go, wow, there's so much more going on. But when you're only focusing on the negative, that's all you see. And I want to suggest you just basically what the text here, look, when it says that two are better than one, that when it comes to getting healthy, you and I can't do it alone. We need each other. Matter of fact, that we are better together than alone. And here Solomon begins to just kind of bring this out to you and to me. Let me give you a New Testament passage so that you can see that this is a theme throughout the whole Bible. Of Old Testament, New Testament. Turn me to Romans chapter 12, and we'll be reading verse 5, and it says, So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, I know right away, as Americans, we go, Ooh, wait a minute, what do you mean belong? No, 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 we don't, we don't belong. I mean, maybe my mother, okay, I belong to my mother and my father and... If I, have, if I have a spouse and some kids, that's it, okay? I got my own little castle here, me against everybody else. But Paul here uses this word belong in such a way that it, it, even the culture of its day just explode and go, wait a minute, that cannot be the case. See, there's something here that Paul knew that he believed in Faith that changed it for him. And this is the thing. Paul believed that every single man, woman, and child in the world was made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God, that God loved every single man, woman, and child, and he created us in such a way so that you and I would never, ever, ever violate another human being made in his image. And that's why he, from over and over, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the apostles and the prophets and the psalmists, constantly told us to, to love God and love your neighbor. Why? Because we are all made in the image of God. And they are worthy because God said so. No different when I told my sons, I said, listen, there's only one person that does the spanking in this house and the hitting. And that's Papa. Because Mama don't want to do it. Mama just makes love, love, you know. I, I, I got to do the spanking. Yeah, see? <laughs> I got to do the spanking. It's all right. But I never allowed my sons to hit their other son. I said, listen, that's my son. I don't care if he's your brother. He's my son. You don't hit him. I love him. And I'm not going to allow you, I don't care if you're his brother, I don't care if you're his sister, aunt, uncle, nobody, I do it. And I believe in the same fatherly way that our Father in heaven looks down and says, that I love you guys so much. You're so valuable. And I don't want your brothers and sisters violating each other. That's how valuable you and I are. You and I were not created to do that at all. Now today I'm going to share the exact opposite of what many of us may have been taught our entire life. Because I believe God promises that if we will do this 
and do it his way, that you and I will never have to struggle with loneliness. That we will be able to overcome fear, fatigue, frustration, failure. That we will be able to handle depression and despair and have it all replaced with God's hope and God's love. You see, God teaches us that the key to joy in your life and in my life is not independence. It's interdependence. Because we need each other. We belong to one another as the scripture just taught us. All made in the image of God. See, God wired us in such a way not to go through life alone, but in community. Why? Because every single one of us have blind spots when it, when it comes to controlling our anger, our bitterness, our unforgiveness, our eating habits, our addictions like drugs, alcohol, pornography, etc., 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 goes on the list. And because of these reasons and many, many more is why I'm wrapping up this teaching series here today called Bod for God. Because our nation is in a spiritual crisis which has led to a health crisis where hundreds of thousands of Americans are dying every year, not fulfilling their God-given destiny because of health-related problems brought on by the belief that our bodies are to be used to gratify self instead of God. And so we began unpacking the first bought for God principle of dedication and how our physical health and our spiritual health are connected and that's how we're able to honor God with our body. Then the following week, we began to unpack the second bought for God principle of our inspiration that only comes from God because He is the source and the solution to all of our problems. He is the key to every closed door. He is the power to every barrier that you and I are going through. And then last week, we began to unpack the third bought for God biblical principle of eating and exercising, which shows us how to break free from this life sentence of slavery and bondage in our life to things and stuff. And then this week, we're going to finally wrap up with the last bought for God biblical principle of how teamwork makes our God-given dreams work. They literally make them um, stick. You know why? Because that probably is one of the biggest struggles you and I have. We get excited for about 3.5 milliseconds. We will go out and we will drop 20, 30 pounds. We will, I'm going to pray and fast for about five minutes. And, and, and we, we do not have the ability to continue to do it on our own unless God gives it to us. Unless you and I are filled with the power from heaven, you and I will give up 3.5 milliseconds after we've made our commitment. And this is why. God knew that and how he created you and I, and he provided an unbelievable way for you and I. And so as we continue to examine today's scriptures, we're going to explore how a biblical team brings the transforming life of Christ in our life as it builds a circle of support around us. How? How? By having confidence in God's unconditional love that makes you and me insiders, not outsiders. And I believe this is best understood when we consider how you and I cannot fulfill God's promises in our life alone. Because we need to belong and be part of God's 
countercultural revolution of love that begins in our hearts and overflows in community towards others. And what this does is it teaches you and me that a biblical community, which the Bible describes as the tangible kingdom of God here on earth, is unique and irreplaceable in your life and in my life because it produces love and good works. It produces the stamina that you and I need. And what we see out of the overflow of that is how it begins to attract those who the world says and who the world marginalizes and rejects and whose society and our culture deems unworthy of love. But the gospel makes them insiders and makes you and me insiders because we're able to experience our worth and our value from our Creator God. And that changes everything. So how is this all possible? First and foremost, because teamwork makes our God-given dreams work. They make them stick. And we need to be with Him for that to happen. Now there's a passage in the scripture that I believe is going to kind of just explode this out for us. If you wouldn't mind turning with me to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to put, Paul begins, the apostle Paul begins to, to kind of lay out this thing, the importance of the body of Christ, the importance of us being in a biblical community, the importance of us being able to fulfill God's given dream that you and I were not meant to to be the Lone Ranger. See, our culture loves the Lone Ranger. We love the Superman. We, we, we love the Marlboro Man. We, we love, you know, I'm just so self-sufficient by myself. I mean, it permeates everything in our culture and society. We've put it on such a high level. And we look down on anybody who, who asks for help, and which is totally contrary to how God designed you and me. All we have to do is go back to the beginning of the book in Genesis and see that when God created the heavens and the earth, the first day, oh, this is good. And the second day, this is good. And the third day, this is good. Fifth day, sixth day, when he created man, this is very good. And then there's this one thing in all of creation that was not good, only one thing, and that was for man to be alone. God did not design you, create you, for you and I to live our lives in a cave by ourselves. And every time we do that, what ends up happening is the more we isolate each other, the more we find ourselves unable to receive love and to be able to give love. It is unbelievably crucial because if we're not able to do that, we can't love our spouses and our children and our family which is just permeates the fact that we're unable to really understand how to connect and love God. So let's look in there. I'm going to pull out five things here from this text. I think I, I could pull out 20 throughout the Bible. I could pull out 100. And I, these are five just key things I believe here in this particular text that I hope that you're going to spend and allow the love and the grace of God to go deeper into our lives. Because you and I need to soak. This does not come natural. See, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn. This does not come natural to me at all. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, tough-minded. You know, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. You know, my dad never asked for help. Never once, you know, you know, he hand out. You know, he calls it a handout, which gives it a negative connotation. I mean, he won't even allow me, his son, to help him. And that's just old-school guy. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. I mean, he, that's how we've been raised. And that's how we have it in our culture. And we end up losing out in our God-given dreams because we're trying to do it alone. Well, let's read the text. Hebrews chapter uh, 10, verse, starting with verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, 
having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who, pro who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habits of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Verse 19, right there in the first verse, 19, Paul describes this whole issue of brothers, not singular, brother, but brothers. In other words, that, that there's a body, that you and I are part of a, a community, a team. And what I want to suggest to you is how that you and I, we need others to walk with us. I believe Paul just kind of makes that clear in this particular passage. That community is God's answer to our loneliness. That many of us, I retired from the NYPD. Now, in New York City, which is a little bit different than the city of Northport, let's see if I can give you a little demographic. They said in 2010, the 2010 census said that Northport's about 104 square miles uh, with uh, about 58,000 people. And uh, just in the borough, there's five boroughs that make up the city, but just in the borough of Brooklyn, Bro Brooklyn is 99 square miles. And it has 2.8 million people in it. So if you think your streets are crowded, you don't know what crowded is, okay? Now the reason why I said that was because I can't tell you that in a, in a, in a borough with 2.8 million people, that in all my years in law enforcement, I met some of the most loneliest people ever. I mean, there's people everywhere. I mean, it's, it's like a big old anthill. And people are lonely. Now, I'm the chaplain for the Northport Police Department. I go on, on uh, uh, rides with them. And though... The intensity probably is not the same, but I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many houses, how many calls we get. And most of the times, if you've been in law enforcement for more than five years, many times you'll get calls just because people are lonely. And they just, they don't talk, they have no friends. They got neighbors on right to left and in front of them. They got a whole bunch of people, but for some strange reason, we don't talk to each other. We go from our air-conditioned house into our air-conditioned car, into the to the air-conditioned store, buy our groceries or go pick up food or whatever, go back into our air-conditioned car, drive to our house, hit the remote control for the garage door, wave at our neighbor, and that's the extent of us connecting with our neighbor. Welcome to Florida. City of New York City, no different. You got people who live, one building, 5,000 people, and never know your neighbor across this, right next to you, above you, below you. And I tell you, that's not how you and I are to live. And the most loneliest people. And God created us in such a way that you and I would be able to experience life in a richer way. And community is what I believe God's answer to our loneliness. There's no doubt in my mind. I mean, look at, if you look at the scripture... God sent out the disciples individually, two by two, minimally. If you look at when Jesus went to the uh, Mount of Transfiguration, he brought James, John, and Peter with him. When he went to the uh, uh, Garden of Gethsemane, everywhere he went, he never went alone. Matter of fact, he actually went to the disciples in the garden and he says, could you just pray with me for an hour? Come on, buddies. I need you, man. Even in his humanity, he was constantly reminding you and me of our need for one another and our belonging and how important it is for us to fulfill God's purposes and God's plan in our life together. You and I were not called to be alone. And that's why Paul begins there with this issue of brothers. 
you jump down in verse 24, it says, let us consider how we may spur one another. And I know many of us begin to kind of push back here a little bit because if you go back into the original language, the Bible, the, the New Testament was uh, written in Greek, ancient Greek. And uh, that word for spur can also be translated irritated. Now, that's kind of, from my point of view, I like that. I'm pro, you know, to irritate you. Some of you who know me more than 15 minutes, probably go, yeah, man, you irritate me to no end. And now I'm not talking about that type of irritation. I'm not talking about the irritation that you see that uh, my dad sees in the church because he's always looking at the negative. We're talking about the fact that you and I, that we need others to watch over us. And again, I know we begin to push back because we're Americans and we idolize independence. And I don't need anybody. And I, you know, I'm, I'm going to have my own. I don't want to walk across the street and ask, for a cup of milk or eggs or such and such. I'm going to get my own. And I tell you, we have fallen so far, even from our own culture. But you and I, I believe, as the word says here, needs, because I believe God answer to our defeatist community. I mean, think about this. Um, you and I have blind spots. They're just things you and I do not see. And it's right there in front of our nose. And what irritates us is when somebody comes along and says, hey, you know, you, you, you got a smudge on your nose. No, I don't. Yes, you do. And that's someone who cares for you. But our natural reaction, just like mine, is to push people away. No, 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 no. And I tell you, it is so important because we need to be like parents. See, when I, and this is why our, our adolescent children and, and, and our teenage children, they just grit their teeth and they suck on, you know, and they give you all that attitude because we love our children way too much to see them do something in their life that we know is going to hurt them. We love them way too much. We will irritate them for love's sake, for Jesus' sake. Because we've walked this life and we know the pitfalls and the danger and the dead end and the suffering that's at the end of their road. And they're too young and too inexperienced to see past their nose. And they can't see it. And that's why the scripture says to spur one another. We have to be able to encourage one another and to love people, to be able to speak into their life in such a way that they will not give up. Let me just tell you that I, I, my heart and my prayer for us here at New Hope, and I know we, we haven't arrived. We're, we're in process working, but I pray that we would be a people who are honest and open with our weaknesses that we are so confident in the love of God that that is our source of self-esteem, that is our source of strength, that we can literally speak into one another's lives, to spur each other, as the scripture says, and not be so easily offended and wounded and, oh, you know. Let me tell you something. It takes someone who cares for you. The scripture teaches us in Proverbs that Better a harsh word from a friend than choice words from an enemy. And a friend who cares about you more than themselves will have the courage to be able to speak into your life even if it risks the friendship. That's what a parent does. I know that if I have to say something to my child, who's a grown man now, I want to listen. <laughs> but anyway, I love him enough. Even if he doesn't like me, it's okay. Because I know I'm doing everything I can for him. So to spur one another. Uh, if you go further there in, in verse 24, he said, not only spur one another on 
towards love and good deeds. And I want to suggest to us that not only as we're looking at what, what does this biblical community look like, that you and I need one another to work with us. We can't do it alone. God, community is God's answer to your fatigue and my fatigue. We're, we're worn out and exhausted because we're trying to do it on our own. I don't want to join anybody's team. I want to do it in my way. I got my own opinions. My own, praise the Lord. Okay, I hope that works for you. God created you and me to be able to do much more together than alone. God called us in this community to, to be able to, to live a life. And what's happened, and I'm going to confess, for many, many years, in the early years of New Hope, we, we basically ran one deep. One deep. One person leading children. One person leading youth. One person you know, leading you know, uh, one area or another. And what we had is a massive exhausted group of people. One person leading worship. Exhausted. And we've seen so many burnt who, people who love the Lord and just exhausted. And we said, we love you too much. We're going to irritate you to no end to be part of a team. We want you to be able to experience the fullness and the joy of God and not be exhausted you doing it on your own. And this is so critical for us. Because we know that we can accomplish more together than we can alone. And there's just too much need for us to be able to do that by ourselves. No more one deep. Verse 25, it says, Let us not give up meeting together. And I, I want to su suggest here that we need others to witness alongside with us. This is so critical, I believe. Not only is it important for us to watch over us, not only do we need people to work alongside us, not only do we need people to come alongside to, to take away that deep loneliness in our hearts that we all feel on some level, and which makes us bitter and angry, and, 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 and we become unsociable, and we can't receive love, and we can't give love, and I mean, it just... I mean, you, you have co-workers like that somewhere. I mean, your neighbors. Imagine. Imagine what it would look like making them insiders. And say, no, no, yeah, we know you're ornery. We're going to love you anyway. <laughs> yeah, you irritate me to no end. I'm going to help you out. I tell you that the most hardened heart breaks over the genuine, authentic care and compassion. I don't believe anyone, and this is why I think it's so, so important that we get to meet with one another because it's terrifying to do life alone. It is. It's terrifying. Community is God's answer to our fear. He built us in this way. We are stronger together. We are healthier together. We enjoy life together. Who likes to be on a vacation by themselves? I forgive you for some of those. My, my apologies if I offended those who do like going, ah, it's me and the tree. God bless you. You know, nothing wrong with that. But this is what I know. We can't live there forever. I mean, all of us need a time of draw away and just recoup. I get that. I'm not talking about that. That's, that's normal. That's healthy. Okay? I'm talking about the one who just, I just, they're miserable. They're just ornery. And they just don't see the benefit of how they would be more healthy together. Why it's so important. Why God commanded us to meet together and gather together because he knows we're more healthy that way. He knows that it answers the longings of our heart and the loneliness of our heart, the fear in our heart, the fatigue in our heart. 
And the enemy is out there doing everything he can to keep us away. Last thing I want to suggest there, the end there of uh, verse 25, it says, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. And let me just say that this is probably the one that we push back the most, especially for us as men, but I believe that we need others to weep with us, to laugh with us, to joy with us. And this is pretty much God's, community is God's answer to our despair. I'm going to tell you something, it is, our, this, our generation has seen the largest amount of suicide I have ever experienced. This is what the research tells us for law enforcement, that the number one reason for death over the last 20 years, except for two years, for a death of a police officer was not a line of duty death. Suicide. Other than 9-11 and another year, that was the only years that suicide was not the number one. I'm going to tell you something. Here in the city of Northport, I can't tell you how many call outs I get and how many people who are so lonely and so full of fear and so full of despair. I'm talking from young and old and everything in between okay, taking their lives. It is, I, it's like an epidemic in this city. It blows my mind. I'm like, what in the world? We've lost our sense of hope. And many of us are just so exhausted trying to get into the in crowd so that we would feel loved and accepted and we realize that God has already unlavishly, unconditionally loved you. See, this is, this is the great thing about, I believe, how God is so concerned for you. I don't believe anybody should be alone when they're in the hospital waiting to see if a loved one is going to make it. I don't believe any one of us should be alone waiting for that phone call from the doctor to see about our test results. And I tell you, you guys here at New Hope do a great job because you're considering and thinking about someone else more than yourself. I tell you, Norm and I, we spend most of our waking day thinking about you guys. How can we come alongside them? How can we help them grow? How can we help them discover the beautiful truths of God? And we pray and we plan and we build teams and we help people do that. I wish I could be at every hospital visit. I wish I could be at every place. Just physically impossible. And that's why we don't do one deep anymore. I wore out a whole team of God-fearing people trying to do one deep. It does not work. That's, the, that's a corporate America mindset. God's called us to release the gifts and release the body and release people to be able to do what God's purpose in their hearts to do. But we need to be on a team to do that, to encourage us, to train us, to teach us, to provide the opportunities. And Norm and I, we, we love it. We love the fact that God puts you guys on our minds every single day. How can we come alongside them, Lord? Lord, how can we help them? in the midst of their trip, who can we put around them to love on them and bless them? And I tell you, this is the great thing because we need mothers and fathers of the faith who are going to do that. And I know many of you are going, Eddie, you know, this sounds really nice and high and mighty, but the reality is, like my dad would tell me, I don't see that happening. <laughs> and you're right. You know why? Because we got a lot of infants too in the church. We have a lot of people who are seeking. We have a lot of adolescents in their faith. And you know how that is. You know, when my, when my sons were, were infants or when they were adolescents, I mean, they, they had one theme, me, myself, and I. I get that. When, when, when they got older, they knew more things. Now they started talking back to me what they knew about me, myself, and I. It's the teenage years. You know how that goes. And then what ends up happening is that we have those who are mature in the faith, but they tend to be stuck. Either through wounds or pains, disappointments, hurts, and they're stuck. 
But see, with God, what he's asking, you read this, God's called to be mothers and fathers of the faith. And mothers and fathers are not going to give up on a loudmouth teenager who gives them lip and sucks their teeth. I'm committed to my boys. I'm going to love them unconditionally, even when I don't like them. Even when I, mm, should I feed them to the alligators? You know what I mean? I mean, what the, you yeah. know. That's a mother and a father. And you're right, we need more mothers and fathers in the faith who are not so self-consumed and absorbed, who are actually thinking about someone else other than themselves. When we gather, we're, look, we come with a hymn and a word and instruction. We're coming thinking about, okay, Lord, open up an opportunity for me to love someone, invite someone out to lunch. Lord, help me. And yes, and yes, many of us are not in that place yet. Praise, that's okay. We love you. But we have an expectation that one day you're going to go from an adolescence to a young adult to a mature person, and ultimately to a father and a mother in faith. And when you don't, we're going to irritate you. We're going to spur you on for Jesus. Hallelujah, right? I'm out of here. Don't rush for the door right now. But I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> it's because we love you. And because your Father in heaven loves you so much. And I want you just to really kind of get, this is the reason why. One of the great things that Jesus asked us to do, one of what we, what we, in our terminology, call a sacrament, is the Lord's table, communion. This has nothing to do with what denomination you come from, what, you, you know, what you're accustomed to. That's all man-made ritual and religion and traditions. The scripture is very, very clear. Jesus just asked us to do this in remembrance of him. That's it. It's the only scripture you're going to find in there. I'm not going to ask you if you're a card member, card carrying member of this church or that church, or if you did these 15 things or whatever. Well, when we come to the Lord's table, it reminds us of this one truth that our Father in heaven. 24 hours a day, seven days a week is thinking about you and how he can come alongside you and how he can help you and how he's loving you when you become the most unlovable person right now. When you're in rebellion, when you're in disobedience, when, when you're, you're pushing away, when you're in those teenage spiritual years and you're just fighting and fighting and fighting. You don't even know why you're fighting. You're a rebel with no cause, but you're fighting, right? And our Father in heaven he thinks about you. He's planning for your success. He has a plan and a destiny and a purpose for you. And he's saying, listen, I want the best, best, best for you. And so when you come, I want you to remember that your father loves you more than anything else. And because of that, he, he, not men, created the body of Christ come alongside you, to spur you on, to love and good deeds, to spur that in because you and I don't have it naturally. You and I naturally do not have, not an ounce in of ourselves. We naturally default to me, myself, and I. We all do. And that's why God has then raised up mothers and fathers in the faith who are going to come alongside you and in your most worst of moments when you're the most unlovable, when you do the most horrific thing, God's going to call a mother and a father to come alongside you in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your terrible lifestyle, and love on you. Because none of us deserve it. And the mother and the father of faith knows that their child does not deserve it. Deserving has nothing to do with loving your children. It is a burden of the heart. It is a transformation. There are things that you would do for your children you would never do for anybody else. You would never tolerate the stuff that your children give you. Never. And imagine now that God, who died on the cross to prove to you and to me of his great love, his body was broken, his blood was shed, 
that you and I would experience the love of God in a way that we never had before. And I tell you, my friends, no one can come to the cross and be so radically transformed. Let me just say that I know that there are many times for me where I did not feel that I belonged at all. I didn't feel that I was accepted. I always felt the odd person out. I always had my dad in the back of my head. Church was not always a positive experience for me. And I was always looking like my dad to the negative. And there might be some who hear that might feel that way right now. You don't belong. And I pray that you, by the grace of God, would be confident in the unconditional love and acceptance of God right now. That you do belong that you are worthy, that you were purchased with the price. And God built and put all these people around us to spur one another, to encourage one another, to love and good deeds, that you would fulfill your God-given destiny and that you would never settle for anything less. And for some of us, we need to lay down our rebellion and our sin and our disobedience and say, okay, you know what? I need to give you my life for the very first time. And I pray right now where you are, you would just, it's between you and God, not between you and me. And those who have made that decision have never been water baptized as God has asked us to do. This is our first act of honoring God with our body. That you would consider tonight at 6 o'clock, we'll be at Blind Pass Beach. Just come and honor God with your body and be water baptized as he asked you to because you know that you are now part of something larger than yourself in this great kingdom of God. And I'm going to tell you, there are some great groups that are going on, small groups. If you've not participated in the, the, the Lose to Live and they got five teams going on, it's just a great thing. You can just come on Wednesday night. You don't got to be part of a team and just sit. And I tell you, just get blessed as people are using their gifts and talents for the Lord. It's just an amazing thing. In the back of your weekend program, there's all these small groups going on. Listen, man, be part of a community. It'll, it'll make you healthier. It'll bless your life. And you'll be able to enjoy things you never enjoyed before. It's an awesome thing. And this is why we remember why his body was broken, his blood was shed for us. Let's take that together. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for every single person here. And may we continue to allow your love and your grace to go deeper and deeper in our life as we begin to trust you more and more. And that we would be able, Lord, to experience and receive your love so that we'd be able then to offer love to those that we love, our spouses, our children, our, our parents, our siblings, our neighbors, our coworkers. Help us to be the people you call us to be. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.